what's up guys welcome back to the channel I'm excited to have you here today because this is gonna be a video about some 90s Batman goodness that was put on my radar because of bearded comic bro with his uh, Victor Zaz uh, character profile so he talked about a couple of books in there I'm going to cover the actual origin story for Victor Zaz as well as Shadow of the Bat the first four issues in a storyline called The Last Arkham, where um, there's some crazy weird attitude issues with Batman. There's uh, some strange characterizations going on here, but it has like that 90s pop and flair to it. And so it's an interesting story and it really gets you into the mind of Victor Zaz and what makes him such a dangerous villain for Batman. Before I ramble too long, don't forget to like and subscribe, comment, connect, follow, do whatever you do on the platform you're on. Just look for my furry face inside of an orange circle and click all the buttons next to it. So the first book that, um, well I think the main book that Bearded Comic Bro covered was The Shadow of the Bat, The Last Arkham. And uh, that was interesting, but he said, Go back and check out the Batman Chronicles number three. That is the origin story for Victor Zaz. So I decided to start there. And the Batman Chronicles seems to be a uh, like an anthology. So there's a couple of different short stories in here. I believe the Victor Zaz story is the third story in the uh, the issue that it's in, number three. So um, the name of the, the story is The First Cut is the Deepest. And this is written by Alan Grant, and uh, the art is done by Jennifer Graves. And this story, I believe, it is listed as a 1995 story. And Shadow of the Bat, The Last Arkham, came out in 92. So this is kind of a retroactive uh, origin story for Victor Zaz. But Alan Grant worked and wrote on all of these books. So this is definitely a character that um, he had a, a good streamlined story for. So the first cut is the deepest. This starts with uh, Victor Zaz being escorted to like a... They, they put him in this like square cell in the middle of a room. But inside that cell there's also like this cylinder wall. It looks like a tin can. Um, and it goes... So he has to go into the cage and into the cylinder. And there's only a cutout for his mouth. So a lot of times when he's in prison the way that you see him interact is like... You just see his mouth through this little window. Um, which has a, a chilling effect for his delivery. So they escort him into this cell. Well, it's inside of a big open room and uh, he has a psychiatrist. She sits down and, uh, or a therapist. I don't know, I'm never clear on psychology versus psychiatry. Um, psychiatrics would, to me, indicate that they're the ones that prescribe medication. But uh, I could be totally wrong on that. So she sits down and she's having a conversation with them. And what she's trying to find out is what causes Victor Zaz to murder. Like she's thinking he has some sort of mental illness um, or some sort of sickness that, that kind of drives him to murder. And so Victor Zaz tells a story. He reveals that he isn't sick, that he grew up in a perfect home where he was provided with everything that he needed and wanted. And he had grown up, he was real successful, he ran like a Fortune 500, he was like a CEO and all that. So he had a very successful early adulthood, but when he was 25, his parents passed away in a tragic boating accident. And this pretty much like broke him. From there, he kind of spirals out. And so this kind of like plays into, um, it, it's, it's very addiction oriented. Um, because we know like gambling is an addiction, right? It's people that are addicted to gambling. They don't actually want to win. The, the best hit is when you almost win, whenever it stops at the seven, but then barely rolls over to the, uh, the cherries or whatever, you know, like when you almost hit, but it's a miss, that's the most exciting part. And Victor Zaz definitely got addicted to this. He was throwing away all of his money. Um, he had tons of money from the insurance payouts on his parents to his inheritance to the fact that he was running he was the CEO of a massive corporation like this guy had money 
and he just starts burning it after his parents died like he's going through it like crazy and uh what he found like he got he he really got messed up whenever he looked in the mirror one day because he was in this spiral right and he realized that gambling was filling that hole in in his life instead of living life and and being a person he had become this zombie that was just empty inside that was filling this space with gambling and so he uh it, it it gave him a rush like no other to play and so one night he's playing and he kind of like gambles he, he puts everything on the table and he's up against penguin who it does not play fair so cobblepot takes all of his money and so and and zaz basically gets kicked out of the casino at that point because he has no more money so with nothing left zaz decided to take his take his own life and escape this world but before he was able to jump a homeless man with a knife attempts to rob him of anything that he might have left on his person but zaz wrestles with them to be able to get the knife away and basically what happened is victor zaz wanders out onto this bridge he puts a rope around his neck and he's going to jump off the bridge and like he even says in the dialogue you know he doesn't care if he the rope's too long and he hits the bottom or if it's too short and it snaps his neck who cares he just wants out of this life this guy comes up with a knife and tries to rob him he tells him you know you're you're not about to need any of the stuff in your pocket so just give me everything you have and this sparks something in zaz and he like um he recognizes the guy like not not the person but he looks into his eyes and he sees what he saw in the mirror when he looked at himself just this empty hollowness this zombie and so zaz decides that he is going to kill this man or I guess they kind of wrestle over the knife and then Zaz realizes that as he's looking into his eyes and says, you know, like, I'm going to kill you to help you escape your zombie-like existence. So Zaz definitely looks at his murders as a way to free people from, like, the worldly, um, I guess, like, problems they have surrounding them, you know, whether they're a slave to work or they're a slave to an addiction or um a substance or whatever else you know like he sees himself as freeing these people he's taking them out of that zombie like state and so after this goes down uh you know he he kills this man and this is when he decides to cut his arm and he puts a mark in his arm and so the first cut is the deepest is a reference to the fact that this is his first kill and if you know victor's as he marks his body for every kill so he marks his body and that's his first kill his first mark and uh then he we cut back to the therapist talking to him in the prison and this is where he kind of starts to play some head games and he starts mumbling and acting strange and so uh the therapist gets from her chair gets up from her chair and she kind of approaches the bars and suddenly zaz's arm comes out of the little mouth hole you know and grabs her and as she fights and struggles he talks about how he only kills to kill he uh you know there's there, the only reason is to take people to to free them of their zombie like existence and so he chokes her to death and uh that's where the story ends it leaves us with zaz in the inside the cell and uh his therapist laying on the floor dead so that's the origin story for victor zaz and it's a pretty good story i would like to see it um i think it would be cool to have a lot of those elements adapted into the b plot of uh the batman 2 or whatever they would call the sequel i don't think um and, and we'll see that here too like zaz doesn't really seem to play a role in like the forefront he would definitely be more of a b plot in a fully developed movie or tv show or something um but he's definitely an interesting character to have bubbling just below the surface so after that we get to shadow of the bat and this actually came out before uh the batman chronicles the deepest cut so or the first cut is the deepest and there are like some inconsistencies there i think in the batman chronicles they refer to him as having 147 kills um whereas in shadow of the bat they only refer to it as i think just 47 kills so there's some discrepancy there because even though you know that story was written later it technically takes place before this so how is he in prison now with marks all over him and only has 47 kills but in the batman chronicles three years later they write him as having 147 kills 
before that in the time so yeah there's like some some weird things there but overall shadow of the bat's pretty interesting i feel like it falls apart in four um not terribly but i mean it's just four is not like the most solid ending but overall i enjoyed this series because uh it deals with like batman being locked in jail um we see the passing of the torch for arkham asylum and this is kind of a new generation for arkham asylum it's converted basically from a prison to a um you know what we know it today is like more of an asylum and uh a lot of crazy characters in here so when the the first issue opens arkham is empty to allow for a massive overhaul and remodeling of arkham asylum after jeremiah arkham takes over the family business from his lunatic uncle amadeus arkham the prisoners are not happy and jeremiah has some weird proclivities about keeping old stuff so there's like a lot going on here with um jeremiah is taking over and his uncle was uh amadeus arkham he built the original prison and he he seems to have like spiraled out and uh kind of lost his mind and they're not sure why he went crazy i guess but it's something that weighs on jeremiah all the time he's afraid that people are going to perceive him as crazy because his uncle um ended up turning into what he was uh trying to heal i guess so um and then the other thing is they're like throwing out stuff and jeremiah is real dismissive of the past like we don't need to keep anything get rid of it all and all the prisoners are being escorted out because they're going to basically rebuild all of arkham so the prisoners return to the prison to find cells and new punishments for their crimes and themes so like now they have like a glass room to put a uh, scarecrow in um they have like this labyrinth of mazes and stuff so that the prisoners can't really learn how to get around and stuff like there's a lot of weird things that happen here but it's because it's, it's being converted over uh they added like padded rooms you know because it's being converted into an asylum instead of a prison at this point um jeremiah is represented as a mad brutal man with uh outdated psychological techniques he claims he is doing this for the rehabilitation but the punishments are cruel and mean and he doesn't really value the life of the criminals and um yeah that's another thing is like he has like a, a big ego about things and so he's trying to control the prisoners and he's trying to deprive them of everything so that he is their everything he's their lifeline they have to beg him for food they have to um, they get beaten very brutally whenever things aren't going right, if they try to do anything weird, you know. And we see all of this play out across the book. It's very apparent whenever Batman's in there what conditions are really like. So uh, we cut to Robin out on the town. He's um, taking down some, just like some average uh, lackeys, I guess. And uh, whenever he gets done with them, he goes to leave and he runs into Nightwing. And Nightwing shows up talking about, like, he's heard and this, that, and the other. So, um, we're not really sure what he's talking about at this point. Robin knows what he's talking about, but he's also being kind kind of cryptic. But we know that something has happened with Batman. And, uh, so that's kind of what they're worried about here. And then we see, uh, Jeremiah, he has a session with Zaz where, uh, you know, Jeremiah himself, he becomes uncomfortable of the thoughts of becoming a, a crazy person like his uncle so zaz is kind of uh zaz is like messing with his head and he's telling him like you're no better than amadeus like you're just going to turn into another uh patient here instead of a doctor or a healer and this is really upsetting because um for jeremiah because he's uncomfortable he's always afraid of that inevitability and this is where we see uh, the book here pretty much ends up, Batman is shown, he's in full costume and cow, and he's handcuffed to the wall in uh, the Arkham cell, and Jeremiah sends in all the orderlies, uh, and they go, and they, they start beating him with batons, not that Batman doesn't get his punches in, like he's pretty quick, even though his hands are chained to a wall, but uh, they do eventually get the best of him, and they start to beat him, and uh, he starts claiming, you know, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, it's not my fault, or whatever, um, you know claiming innocence and jeremiah kind of laughs at him because you know that's what everyone says nobody's going to come in here and admit what they did so we're left to believe that batman did something wrong and he's locked in this cell and uh, whenever they're beating him one thing that i thought was kind of interesting um is like they beat him down and then they're about to remove his mask and 
Arkham tells them no. Like, Jeremiah says, like, no, don't take his cowl off. He's going to reveal his true identity whenever he's healed. And so that's kind of letting us know how big Arkham's, uh, Jeremiah Arkham's ego is. Like, this dude is crazy because he thinks that he's going to heal Batman of whatever afflictions he has. And uh, he's just going to, like, take off the mask and be like, oh, yeah, you're right. I was out of my mind this whole time. Thank you for healing me, Doctor. My name's actually Bruce Wayne. So we know that's obviously not going to happen, but it's a great insight to how big Jeremiah Arkham's ego is. We move on to part two, and uh, we see this is more or less a flashback. We're going back to how Batman ended up in jail. So Batman swings into an old cemetery as he hears a little girl's voice. He observes her being physically and verbally abusive to the doll she's playing with, and he realizes that this is because it's how she's treated at home. Her father, um, you know, he seems to, as he talks, as Batman talks to this girl, he finds out that her father is very abusive toward her, and so he's like, don't worry about it, I'm going to take you home, and I'm going to talk to your dad. So, to me, this came off a little bit old school in the sense of, like, 66 Batman, where, like... I'm going to come sit down and have dinner with your family and we're going to work out all your personal problems. Um, so it has a little element of that, but then um, it also, looking forward, Chip Zdarsky does a Red Hood story. Um, he's doing it, it's like in uh, shorter story segments, and it's in Urban Legends, the Batman Urban Legends book. And in there, this story, like, there's a lot of these elements. Uh, this, partic this scene in particular feels a lot like some scenes that are in Chip Zdarsky's Red Hood that's going on so I think there was definitely some inspiration here this seems like the kind of thing that maybe was formative for Chip Zdarsky um, but it, it's a, a really weird scene the way he swings into the cemetery and this little girl's like just yelling at these dolls and then he like smiles at her with that weird Batman white eyes white teeth smile so um, I thought that was interesting we cut to and this is the part of the series where it starts to cut back and forth quite a bit um, in interesting ways. Like, it lets us know all of these things are happening all at once. Um, so, from here you cut to, uh, there's like this thin, tall man with a uh, top hat. And uh, he's wearing like a tuxedo jacket. He has a knife. And he comes into the house, and uh, this house, and there's like a wife and a husband and a little boy. And the husband is like total garbage, you know. Arr, 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 be quiet I'm trying to watch TV or whatever you know whatever dads did in the 90s um, it, and so this man in the top hat he comes into the house and uh, we see him like kind of stab one person I believe um, but then we're led to believe obviously that he killed him Batman with the little girl they come in the door and they come upstairs and they walk in and that is her family and they're all they all have their necks slit and then they're just left sitting there like watching TV like they're arranged very well like a family and uh, so Batman like rushes out and this is where it starts to get really weird with Batman because he goes downstairs and he sees a guy inside the building it's I think like an apartment building right so you go in and there's like all these apartments so there's like a lobby and stuff well Batman like sees this guy in the lobby and just like beats the crud out of him and arrests him because clearly he's the person that did it since he was in the building whenever Batman showed up without even investigating how long the family's been dead. It's weird. Um, so we see uh, Gordon and Gotham City Police Department. They arrive at the scene. Batman is, like, angry the whole time. Like, he's just brooding like crazy. He decides that um, they're not going to stick around for the forensics because he recognizes the M.O. of these murders. This is definitely the work of Zaz, who is supposed to be in Arkham, but clearly he has broken out and killed this family. And so Batman is going to go to Arkham Prison and he is going to check the cell and he's going to see that Zaz isn't there and he for sure did it. Fast forward to later, they get to the prison in Batman's like super weird 90s car and uh, they meet Jeremiah Arkham for the first time. He takes them to Zaz's cell and, uh, you know, Zaz seems to be there in the bed but he's like covered up and it has glass walls. Like, they don't want Zaz to be out of eyesight ever at all. So Batman starts to get real angry because he's mad because Zaz is there and he knows that Zaz did this. So he wants to know how he's sneaking out of the prison and killing these people. And so Zaz finally kind of like gives up and stands up and throws his blanket off and he's standing there naked. 
and uh, he has no new marks. That's what Batman wanted to see. Um, all the marks are black. There's no fresh cuts on his skin or anything like that. So he must have not killed this family because he would always mark his body if he were to kill anyone, you know? They each get a mark. So on the ride, like, we cut from there, like, as Batman is angrily kicking his way out of the prison, because he just, like, kicks all the doors open now and walks out, because he's angry about this, uh, we see Zaz sit down and pick up his leg, and, like, look at the bottom of, of his foot, and there's three red marks for the man, woman, and son that they, that he killed. So, Batman's, like, angry and brooding with Gordon on the way back to, um, uh, wherever, I guess, Gotham City Police Department, whenever a call comes over the radio for Gordon that there was another murder. So they go, and it's, like, some college kids, I guess, they're, they were, like, hanging out or something, and they, the, the murder scene that they found is, like, these kids, like, sitting there at a table, and, uh, they have their throats cut, and they're just, like, sitting there at the table as if they were still playing poker or whatever they were doing, you know? And, uh, so, of course, this is Batman getting even more mad because now Zaz has killed five people without leaving the prison. And, uh, so he's kind of frustrated as he comes out the door. And this was the weird thing. Like, they get to the crime scene and they get out of the car and they're headed in. Well, there's, like, one police officer, right? There's Gordon walking to the crime scene. Batman's walking along next to him. And then there's some cops, like, guarding. And they let Gordon go by, but this cop's, like, tells Batman, like, no, you can't come in. And Batman, like, quickly just grabs his arm, flips his wrist around, and handcuffs him. He's like, I'll tell you where I'm going to go or whatever. Like, I don't know what the deal is with Batman. It made less sense that this cop is all like, you can't cross the crime scene. You're walking with Gordon. They just got out of the same car, like, right in front of your face. You know that they're together. Why would Gordon not expect Batman to be able to enter the crime scene? This part made no sense, but you see Batman get kind of angry with the cop for, like, telling him he can't cross. So he handcuffs him and walks past anyway. So, like, Batman in this version, like, in this 90s version, like, he's super angry, he's very authoritative, he wants everybody to follow the law, but then whenever a cop tells him something to do, well, then he just, like, handcuffs the cop and tells him, like, no, you don't run me. So, I don't know what side Batman's on in this version, to be honest. Um, so they went upstairs, they see the crime scene, of course, it looks just like the family, they're coming back down, and on the crime scene, there was Lieutenant Kitch. And Kitsch was kind of running the crime scene until Gordon showed up. And so whenever Gordon and Batman come into the crime scene, Kitsch is like, I'm going to go out downstairs and check on the uh, officers and the perimeter, make sure everything's under control outside. So when they come back down the stairs, Batman and Gordon, um, Kitsch is standing outside and he's joking with the cops. And this like super angers Batman. Like he loses his mind and straight dives after Kitsch. Well, Kitsch pulls his weapon and fires off a shot, but it misses Batman. It just goes off into the distance, I guess, or whatever. And so Batman, like, takes him down. He's like, you don't ever pull the pistol on me. And, like, starts beating the crap out of the lieutenant uh, commissioner of the Gotham City Police Department. It's quite strange. Gordon pulls his weapon, and he's telling Batman to stand down and runs up behind him and gives him, catches him, like, right in the temple with the butt of the gun and so batman passes blacks out and passes out and gordon checks kitsch's pulse and he has no pulse he's dead and so batman is arrested and taken to arkham so that kind of informs us how batman got into arkham asylum at the end you know whenever we saw that little bit at the end of the first issue um we also see nightwing and robin are once again meeting up and they're having this conversation and Nightwing is really confused, like, he basically wants to go break into the prison and talk to Batman and find out what's really going on because he can't believe that Batman would kill somebody, much less a cop. And Robin's saying, like, you know, give it time and distance. Like, right now there's so much going on, you can't really tell what's actually happening. But, like, let's just take things one day at a time. Like, Batman's doing fine in prison, he'll be okay there. Let's give it some time to clear up. And uh, Nightwing is very unhappy with that. He jumps off the roof and basically says a couple things about how he thinks, you know, of course Bruce was right for picking Tim to replace Dick, but, you know, he's not just going to wait around for things to happen. And so Nightwing takes off, and that's when issue number three opens with Nightwing standing over the top of the prison. Actually, it might be the end of number two where we see that. And number three, 
we see Nightwing arrive at the prison and basically like on the rooftop where he left off. So he shows up and he moves past a guard. He opens up a vent and climbs into the um, air conditioning ventilation just in time. He's crawling through the vents and stuff and he starts to hear a noise and he like looks around the corner with his flashlight and boom, there's Batman right in front of him. Um, which I guess that was also at the end of number two. You see Batman had like a little metal pick hidden in his mouth, I guess in his teeth or something. I don't know, but he, we know at the end of two, he has a way to pick his handcuffs. So the beginning of number three shows Nightwing go into the vent ventilation. He's moving around the prison and he runs into Batman who apparently also freed himself and climbed into the AC ventilation. So, um, you know, Nightwing's kind of angry because he wants to know why Bruce is doing whatever he's doing and why he didn't tell him anything and this, that, and the other. Batman's like, yo, just chill out. You'll understand later. But we need to go find something. So Batman's like looking for evidence. So they go back the other way down the vents. We cut over to uh, Patrick Glimp. And he's a man. Like he's in t on this talking to his wife in a phone booth. He's got like makeup on. Like lipstick kisses. And his collar's all messed up. And he's trying to defend himself. Tell his wife that he hasn't been out. Hanging out with some floozy or whatever. Um, and he's approached by a man in a top hat and a tuxedo with a knife and um, he kind of opens the phone booth door and he's like yeah what do you want buddy and uh, wait your turn or whatever and so the guy just like pssst, cuts his neck and hangs up the phone while his wife's screaming in the background and then we uh, cut away from there like as we're leaving that scene we see uh, we see the man in the top hat. He's on the phone talking to somebody. And Patrick Glimp is like sitting on the bench like all proper again with, you know, blood running out of his throat. So, um, well, we cut back over and we see Nightwing and Batman. They're in Jeremiah Arkham's office and they're looking for evidence. They, they believe that Zaz is escaping and the only way he would be able to escape this new like super tight prison is if Jeremiah Arkham himself was helping. Um, in fact, whenever Batman went to visit the prison with Gordon earlier, he went over some of some of the security stuff that uh, explains like why Zaz couldn't possibly escape unless Arkham was helping him. So now Nightwing is going through the office. He's like, I don't even know what we're looking for. Batman's like, just look for something on Zaz. Um, Batman finds a folder with the name Everard Mallet on it. And at the same time, <laughs> Nightwing is on the computer looking through files and he comes across one that's marked Ever Everard Mallet and this one sets off an alarm. So we cut to like this weird scene of Jeremiah Arkham asleep in his bed and um, the alarm starts going off to wake him up but it shows us a glimpse of what his dream was and it's things like the Joker like helping an old lady cross the street and Batman shows up and beats him up and... Um, I think there's a scene with like the Riddler doing something. Basically what it is is like all the villains, you know, these times that Batman has stopped them, they were actually doing good things. They were good guys and Batman's just the crazy one. So Arkham wakes up and he sees the alarm and stuff. He calls the orderlies and they rush the door to his office. As they come rushing in, uh, Batman basically just like runs into them all and tries to push them back so Nightwing can get out. He gives Nightwing that folder that he found of the name Everard Mallet and uh, Nightwing basically like jumps and skips over everybody so he can escape so he runs out the vents the guards are uh, once he's out of sight then uh, Batman gives up you know he okay 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 and so they arrest him beat the crap out of him of course arrest him and they take him back to a cell and fortunately Nightwing's able to escape with the, the file on Everard Mallet so um, from there, we've cut to another scene where there's uh, this guy named Zali Hiram, and he is the builder. He is the architect of this new prison. So we cut to him, and he's gambling, but he doesn't have any money. So he tries to borrow some more money, and the guy cuts him off. He's like, no, you already owe us like $50 million or whatever, or $5 million or something. And he's like, but I know I could win. And he's like, no, you have to get pot, you know, you have to pay off your debt before you can get another loan. So he cuts him off. He, and Hiram like leaves the the casino and he's kind of like down looks down on his luck and stuff and as he's walking down the street he's approached by the man in the top hat and the tuxedo jacket again but this time he has a gun and he 
tells uh, this guy, like, you know, go into the uh, alley here, blah, blah, blah. And th the unique thing here is Hiram seems to recognize the man in the top hat. He seems to know who he is and what he's there for and that he's not going to make it out. And um, so we cut to Gordon, basically, and the Gordon and the GCPD are at this alley and they're looking at the crime scene and of course you have Hiram's body sitting in the alley leaning up against the wall the guns there he has a suicide note in the other hand um, and he had a single gunshot wound through the head so you know Gordon checks out the letter it says you know I was in so much debt I'm so sorry honey I couldn't blah 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 you know and so basically uh, Gordon says it's suicide like Batman's wrong it's not Zaz like this whole thing we're doing this ruse to get Batman in prison and stuff these games we're playing all of this stuff is useless because this is not Zaz this is different from all the other murders right so uh, we see that Zaz is now uh, convincing like Zaz is having a session with Arkham and he's getting in Arkham's head again and he, basically he convinces Arkham that he needs to beat Batman in order to impress all the villains so we saw that weird dream where Arkham was kind of like a, a villain sympathizer basically well now we see this scene where um, Arkham wants to impress Jeremiah wants to impress all of the villains all of the rogues gallery and so Zaz has him convinced the only way that he can impress the villains and make them look up to him is if he were to beat the Batman and break him. And so Arkham decides, yeah, that's exactly what he should do. So uh, they uh, they go and they like beat up Batman, right? They come into a cell, they beat him down, and they take him. And the other thing you have to remember is like they didn't check for any like lock picks or anything because they thought that nightwing had freed batman when he came into the prison earlier and no way do they think that batman actually escaped from his own cell so anyway they come in and they beat him into submission and uh they take him they're taking him to a different room now and as they're moving through the hallway they the some other orderlies rush by with a man with a blanket over him like a, a dead man i guess um, and on the, the table is they're willing him by, it says Everard Mallet. So they're, they tell him, I think they tell Batman he had cardiac arrest. So basically they're rushing him to the emergency ward because, uh, they think that he, he's having a heart attack and Batman's like, that's weird because that's the name I'm looking for. Never heard of this person. Now that I need to know more information on him, I find out that he just died in prison. So that's weird. Why would they be moving him now? They, the, they go ahead and take him down the hall and throw him in this room. And it's a big padded room with a glass wall. And on the other side of that glass wall is like all of Batman's bad guys, you know, all of the villains. And so uh, they drop somebody in here called Amygdala. He's like this big roided out, like he kind of reminds me of the Abomination from The Incredible Hulk. Um, and he's just like really angry and tries to beat up Batman. And Batman doesn't fight back at first. He takes a couple of hits while he tries to talk his way out of this. Amygdala is not having it. Uh, he's not very happy. And so Batman, uh, he basically decides, well, I'm not, he says, like, I'm not just going to sit here and take a beating either. So then he starts to fight back and he beats the crap out of Amygdala. It's pretty cool. And uh, so once Amygdala is in sub into submission, Arkham, Jeremiah Arkham is like shown from this like control room uh, with like a camera and stuff on Batman, you know, and he's not very happy. So he hits a button and down comes that, uh, that big sheet of glass and now all the villains have access to Batman. And so they charge him, you get your like 90s freeze frame and that's the end of that issue where we move into part four. And this picks up with like some very strange splash pages. These were laid out a little odd. I don't know if it was like an experimental thing. I don't think it was, it was, I don't know if it was standard for the time, but they were some strange splash panels. Like it's a double page splash with like all these lines coming out and different little slivers of stuff, but you can't even really tell what it is because it, it flowed very weird. It was a strange thing to me. But basically what happens is Batman moves across the page and uh, disables like each villain as he moves across. And, um, you know, so he's kind of left standing there on top of a pile of just like all of his greatest villains all defeated, you know. His clothes in, are ripped and tattered and he's real upset with Arkham. So he's going to give him a piece of his mind. 
Um, so, like, Arkham basically, like, storms out, and he goes to Zaz, and he's upset with Zaz, uh, because he feels like he was played for a joke. Like, Zaz knew that he wasn't gonna win this fight. He don't, he's really mad, he feels like he was played as, like, a joke or a, a nobody, you know? Um, so we cut to Nightwing talking to Jim Gordon, and he's basically explaining... Like, Gordon is telling Nightwing that it, it's off. You know, the ruse is off. Um, Hiram committed suicide. It was not the man in the top hat the whole time. So, like, because it's not the exact same MO, this means that none of these things have ever been true. Kind of a weird leap for Gordon to make, but I guess it helps the story. So, uh, Arkham confronts Batman. Like, he comes in his cell, and he has the orderlies, like, beating the crap out of him. And... This is where Batman kind of gets into Arkham's head because now he's like, oh yeah, you're just... I, Arkham says something that indicates that Zaz was the man that was the person that put this plan into Batman's head. So Batman starts to play that back around and like, oh, so you just listen to whatever Victor Zaz does. It really messes with Jeremiah. And this is where you start to really see the effects of his concern of turning into his uncle. Like, uh, he's very worried about turning into Amadeus and becoming like this crazy person. That's why he doesn't hold on to any of the, the stuff. That's why he wanted like all the past burnt down and everything is because he's afraid being like keeping record of yourself is what makes you go crazy. And so he doesn't want any records of anything, you know? So Batman really gets in his head and Arkham is not happy at all. And it cuts over to Victor Zaz in a cell just like one or two down. And he like opens up this secret wall and he goes down into these tunnels and that gives him access to the sewer and so now he's in the sewer under Gotham and he can get wherever he needs to go um and that cuts see this is where we get to all this cutting but that cuts over to Nightwing he's at Hiram the builder the architect he's at his uh like old office and he's going through all the drawers and he finds this weird book and inside this weird book are the plans for Arkham and it even has like these secret tunnels drawn on it and what he finds out is the main secret exit, it was built into Everard Mallet's cell who was supposed to pay him for putting these secret tunnels so he could escape. And Everard Mallet basically didn't pay him or whatever. Because um, it was a thing, like Hiram was going to make all this money off of building the plans for this new asylum, but he was going to make extra cash to pay off some extra debts by selling secret tunnel plans and so he sold some to uh everard mallet but everard mallet apparently either didn't pay or turned his back on it or something i'm not sure exactly how they had a falling out but mal uh hiram went ahead and sold the plans for the tunnels he went ahead and sold them then to zaz so victor zaz has the plans the problem is now other people know about the secret tunnels like mallet so he needs to disappear and uh, so this is where we see Batman realize that, um, you know, Zaz is like one step ahead of him all the time. So he picks his locks again with the lock pick that they didn't find because they thought that Nightwing had helped him escape. And uh, he tries to go out into the hall. There's like, <laughs> this part was kind of weird. It was just a way to slow Batman down, basically. Um, so what happens is Batman goes into the hallway and there's like this microwave, the system of like microwave motion detectors. So he's able to like open up his, uh, his, his cape, you know, like he takes his cape off and he rips it open and he explains that it's woven with like micro aluminum thread or something. So it's almost like he turns his cape inside out, like rips the seam of it open, turns it inside out. So it's all reflective on the outside and gets inside of it like a hot pocket or something. And he crawls his way like a worm down the hallway through all these microwaves. And he's complaining about how hot it's getting because the aluminum foil reflects all the microwaves, but they absorb the, the heat. And so he's basically like a hot pocket trying to do the worm down the hallway. It's such a strange thing. But that's intercut with Nightwing arriving in the tunnels because now he has the original blueprint plans with all the tunnels and the maps and realized what was going on. So he rolls up in the tunnels just as uh, just as Zaz is getting to where he's been stashing his top hat and his tuxedo and all that, you know, and his knife. So him and Nightwing have it out, which um, 
Zaz had been digging away out of the sewers and stuff. So whenever Nightwing shows up, he uh, it's, it's pretty easy for him to collapse part of the tunnel down on Nightwing. And so that's when he kind of monologues about how he had to kill Mallet Everett or Everard Mallet because he was he knew the secrets about the tunnels. And apparently all of the people that he's been killing, they never make this clear. I, I'm assuming he was killing other people. So when he did the suicide for Hiram, the builder, um, because it seems Hiram, the builder, and uh, Everard Mallet are the only two people that know about these secret tunnels. So he needs to get rid of them so nobody knows about the tunnels. I guess so anytime he gets arrested, he'll go to the same cell and so he'll always be able to escape. Anyway, so I think he was killing these families and stuff as a way to throw them off the scent when he committed the suicide by Hiram, you know? Anyway, he kind of monologues about that as Batman finishes escaping while doing the worm as a hot pocket he does that thing so he shows up as uh zaz is about to take off and leave nightwing buried there and uh so batman's able to get into a good fight with them they have some fisticuffs um of course zaz does not fare well against batman and uh also whenever whenever nightwing found the plans in the office he called gordon and told gordon like i just found the plans i know what's going on he explained it to him so Gordon and Gotham City Police Department show up at Arkham Asylum, come in the front door, and so as Batman is fighting, they're doing that. So Batman frees Nightwing, he's able to beat up Zaz, and they come climbing back up out of into the cell, just as Gordon and GCPD are showing up there. And um, this also kind of exonerates uh jeremiah arkham right he didn't have anything to do with zaz escaping he didn't know about the tunnels he didn't those weren't part of the deal with hiram so like he's free and clear on that but now we know like he's losing his mind and he's probably not the best person to have in charge of arkham asylum and so this is another weird batman moment where batman basically like yells down his throat about how he'll be watching him and he's gonna have him like a bug under his thumb or whatever else like it, it's wild sometimes what batman has to say in these comics um and so that's it like basically they arrest uh they put zaz in custody and uh you know batman and nightwing get to leave the scene of the crime and everything gordon takes it you know so that's it that's how it wraps up it's a decent read i mean this was like i said i think i think victor zaz i think this illustrates how victor zaz could be a great B plot in a movie or even like a couple of episodes of a TV show or something because he is smart like he was always one step ahead of everybody he always had a plan one step he even planned to murder people so that it would be a distraction from the murder he actually does and hopefully the two different MOs would cause the police to like completely lose his scent and not even catch him so Victor Zaz was very smart in this story um the thing with Jeremiah Arkham, like, it was just a little weird. It felt like uh, antiquated writing psychology. So, like, maybe that's on me for reading this so late. But, I mean, the dude is, like, losing his mind. And there's no... I guess he's a psychiatrist. but And they do a little bit of digging into the family background. But it feels so irrelevant. Like, there's a scene where he's, like, 16 and he goes to work at a store... And when he shows up at the store, some the guy already killed like the the guy that he was supposed to be t exchanging shifts with or whatever. Like it's a whole thing that really means nothing because the guy ends up killing himself. I guess it's just supposed to show you that he has seen something that would make his mind crack. But I don't know. There was a lot of weird stuff with Jeremiah Arkham, and he mostly feels like a tool to fuel the Batman plot. Um, Nightwing and Robin's disagreements. Basically, Batman, Bruce, had told Alfred what was going on. And so when he was, when Batman was arrested, Alfred told Robin. And Batman had told him, like, don't tell anybody else or whatever. So then Robin told Nightwing. So, like, that's where all of that weird family drama is coming from. Is, like, Nightwing's upset because he was left out. He wasn't told this information. But yet Robin was given this information and this, that, and the other weird stuff there overall my biggest complaint about this story is batman like he refers to the the his rogues gallery like he's beating them up like beyond mercy um he often refers to them as like scum and low lives and 
Um, I, I know it's like just like a 90s thing, but he really devalues the life of anybody, basically anyone that's not him or Robin, I guess, really, you know. Um, him and Gordon seem to have a pretty good relationship, but like the way he goes after the cop, like that whole thing was weird. And then uh, they kind of bring it around as like, uh, Kitch was alive, by the way. Um, you know, it was all set up as a ruse or whatever as well. But, like, the whole thing was just kind of cheesy and weird. Um, overall, like, what I would like to see. This is how I would play with Victor Zaz in the Batman franchise. Because we're I'm, I'm assuming that there's going to be three movies here, right? The first one is too late to do anything with. What I would like to see in the second movie, uh, the Batman 2, if you will, like, just have a scene where, like, they're going through a casino or something and you see the penguin at a uh, casino table and then have like uh, you know whoever's gonna play Victor's ass be there like getting angry this can happen in the background it doesn't even need any dialogue maybe while uh, Bruce is at the bar having a drink or something you could cut across the the casino to them give them a little conversation but really you just want to show Zaz get kind of angry and Cobblepot taking the full pot and then like Zaz walking off or something boom get enough there and then like in the toward the end of the movie maybe even like a pro a post credit stinger a great way to set it up for the third one would be to show just the scene of like Zaz reaching out of the his cell and choking his psychiatrist from the Batman Chronicles 3 from his origin story so boom in the second movie you've got two scenes that would establish Zaz for the third movie and then maybe take his you know a very streamlined Z Zaz centric version of like basically take all the Zaz elements from the last Arkham and put those as a, a B or C plot in uh, the Batman 3 and so then like you've already established like why is he a murderer? Oh, because he lost all of his money and everything to the Penguin. And then, like, has he murdered before? Well, yeah, we saw it at the end of the second movie. So in the third one, when there's a murderer just, like, lurking the streets and they're finding these dead bodies and stuff, and it's kind of like a side thing that Batman's working on, that's that, you know? So I think that would be a great way to play with them in the movies. I don't, at least based on this, maybe there's more stories with them that I need to read, but based on the last Arkham, I would say he's not quite strong enough to put as like a primary villain. Like, I don't think he could carry a whole movie like the Batman 3 or something, you know, but definitely a subplot to that would be great. I think it would be cool. It wouldn't take a lot because Zaz is, he's really smart. He's one step ahead, but he's also not like physically anything to worry about, right? So it would be very easy for Gotham City Police Department to be working on the Zaz case and Batman's extra intellect popping in every now and then is enough to give them the boost to get ahead of Zaz and catch him themselves, you know? So that could be a great, like, subplot for keeping uh, Gotham City Police Department and Jim Gordon busy, but at the same time kind of, like, bring Batman in occasionally in the movie, a quick scene or two, just to, like, really establish that this is a big enough deal for Batman to be involved, but Zaz is not a big enough threat for him to stop worrying about whatever the central focus is. So that's what I thought of uh, the last Arkham. I will, I mean, honestly, I probably won't read this story ever again, but it was worth reading through that one time. It really, it, to me, it exemplified one Victor Zaz. Like now I know a lot more about this character and what he's all about. And two, it, it was a nice like 90s Batman read. It showed me some of the things that Batman uh, was like in the 90s and how people were thinking about his role in pop culture and in society at large. And then you also have, um, like I said, I mean, there's a lot of elements to this that I've seen in Chip Zdarsky writing. So I'm starting to realize that Chip Zdarsky probably grew up on a lot of 90s comics and he's taking the things that he really liked and the things that influenced him and he's applying those in his own writing now, but he's also dropping a lot of the weird attitude stuff and a lot of the cheesiness of 90s comics, but he's taking the elements that really like had a formative impact on him. And so I think that's really cool. So I think there was three great things that came out of reading this and it was totally worth the time. I hope you guys learned something. I hope that this encourages you to either go back and read about uh, Victor Zaz and read The Last Arkham, or maybe it'll, uh, 
at least be good reference material for you to kind of understand what happened in the story and where it all went and what it all means and the impact it's had on comic books today. So that's all I have for today. I hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know any of your thoughts in the comments below. Are you into Victor's Zazz? Do you think, how would you enter, introduce and utilize Victor Zazz in a movie or TV property? And um, what did you think of the weird attitude stuff? I mean, what was going on with Batman? Was he on steroids or something in the 90s? Because there was like some flip of the dime, roid rage style stuff going on in here. But overall, it was a lot of fun. I hope you guys enjoyed. Until next time, keep flipping pages.